So uh, in this lecture and, and uh, a lecture tomorrow, I'd like to focus on this um, hypothesis called ER equals EPR um, um, in the context of the question uh, whether it can be interpreted as a duality between topology and entanglement. Um, so that's one aspect of, of duality that's associated with this hypothesis. Um, another aspect, as we'll see, uh, uh, is that it's relate, intimately related to the ADS-CFT correspondence insofar as um, <clears throat> uh, one of its initial motivations <clears throat> uh, comes from a particular, what we might think of as a particular entry in the ADS-CFT dictionary. Um, <clears throat> So uh, by way of at least initial introduction, right? So this ER equals EPR hypothesis um, was presented in a paper by Maldacino and Suskin in 2013. Um, and um, before I forget, right? Uh, please uh, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me uh, with any questions at, at any point. Um, <clears throat> so this is supposed to be my, under, per, understand, my, my attempt to understand the ER equals EPR hypothesis. So I don't promise that it's, um, it's a rigorous understanding, or, <clears throat> or even if, if it's a if it's if it's uh, an adequate uh, um, um, understanding, but um, it's my attempt to understand it. Right? <clears throat> so the ER equals EPR hypothesis, um, uh, simply put, is the claim: uh, the subsystems of a composite system in a quantum entangled state, uh, that's the EPR part of the equation, um, are connected by an Einstein-Rosen wormhole, right? the ER part. So it's, it's extremely simple to state, right, um, um, on the surface, uh, but it, it, potential, it has potentially profound implications. Right? Um, I mean, is, is this a way to reconcile an essential aspect of quantum theory, on the one hand, entanglement, um, with uh, a fairly unique aspect of general relativity, right? Um, the existence of space-time solutions to the Einstein equations that can be interpreted in terms of, of a wormhole. Um, can it be interpreted as a duality between entanglement and space-time topology? <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, one of the initial app, uh, uh, uses uh, that Maldacene and Suskin put it to in, in their original paper uh, was they proposed uh, it as a solution to the firewall problem uh, in the context of uh, black, the black hole information loss paradox. Um, and moreover, in this article, um, they point to intriguing similarities between quantum entangled states and wormholes. For instance, they observe that uh, both cannot be used to send superluminal signals, um, and both are not affected by local operations um, appropriately construed. <clears throat> um, so uh, in, in this lecture, um, I'd like to, uh, this lecture consists of essentially a review um, of Kind of the basic aspects of, of wormhole spacetimes and general relativity um, and um, how spacetime structure might be associated with quantum entanglement. Um, and then an, um, uh, a, a brief discussion of the initial motivation for the ER equals EPR hypothesis. Um, and in the second uh, lecture uh, tomorrow, I'd like to consider um, additional motivations that have appeared in the, in particular in the physics literature um, since uh, Maldacena and Suskin's article. Um, but this first lecture uh, I've organized into three parts. Right? So the first part is a review of uh, wormhole spacetimes in general relativity. So I'll, I'd like to start kind of with a war warm up exercise, uh, a review and basic aspects of Minkowski spacetime, and then move on to two examples of wormhole spacetimes in general relativity, um, extended Schwarzschild spacetime. Um, and extended ADS Schwarzschild spacetime. Um, and then in the second part, uh, um, I'd like to consider how entanglement might be related to spacetime structure um, in the particular context of quantizing a field uh, in a background spacetime. So uh, I'll, I'll, first like, I'll first look at the example of uh, field quantization in Minkowski spacetime, and then it's a fairly simple step to consider uh, field quantization in extended Schwarzschild spacetime. Um, and with those two examples in hand, and the last part of, of this lecture, uh, I'd like to consider um, this initial motivation for the ER equals EPR pair, uh, hypothesis uh, that uh, 
Maldacena and Susskind uh, discuss in the very first part of their paper. And this is an example due to a previous article by Maldacena uh, in 2003, in which he proposes a correspondence between extended ADS Schwarzschild spacetime on the one hand, and a particular entangled state in a conformal field theory. On the other hand, uh, what's called the thermofield double state. Right? And, and this example is presented in the context of, of the ADS CFT correspondence. Um, all right, and, and again, I'll, I'll leave uh, additional motivations for ER equals EPR to, uh, to tomorrow's lecture. Um, so uh, uh, first part, uh, let's begin a, a, a brief review of basic features of, of ultimately of, of wormhole space times and general relativity. <clears throat> um, so uh, for this review, uh, I'm relying heavily on um, Sean Carroll's textbook on general relativity. Uh, I believe it's entitled Space Time and Geometry, um, as well as um, a review article uh, by Daniel Harlow um, from 2016. This is his uh, Jerusalem lectures on black holes. <clears throat> Um, so let, let's let's remind ourselves of basic basic properties of Minkowski spacetime. So Minkowski spacetime is the unique zero curvature vacuum solution to the Einstein equations uh, with spacetime interval uh, expressed in what we might call the Minkowski inertial coordinates p x y z, uh, given by this hopefully familiar expression. Right. So really, this is a way of calculating distances between points in in Minkowski spacetime. It's it's a way of representing the metric, right? the distance between a point labeled by coordinates t x y z and a point that's infinitesimally close to to that point labeled by uh, coordinates d t d x d y and d z. Um, so the distance formula, the, the interval, uh, formally looks like the interval for a standard Euclidean space, right? In this case, a four dimensional Euclidean space, except of course for the minus sign in front of the uh, in front of the time coordinate term. Um, and of, of course, um, in the Minkowski spacetime interval can be expressed in different coordinates, right? So in spherical coordinates, um, TR and, and these two uh, angular coordinates, it takes this hopefully familiar form um, and uh, uh, the transformation between inertial coordinates and spherical coordinates uh, uh, take these forms. Right? Um, now, uh, Minkowski spacetime uh, can be thought of as an extension of a smaller spacetime, which is referred to as Riddler spacetime. Um, and the reason why I'd like to review this feature of Minkowski spacetime is going to be because, as we'll see, um, uh, the two examples of wormhole spacetimes that I'd like to consider also have this basic feature. They can also be thought of as space uh, as extensions of smaller spacetimes. Um, so uh, to, to, to understand how Minkowski spacetime can be thought of as an extension of a smaller spacetime, Rindler spacetime, um, uh, uh, we're asked to first uh, consider uh, what's called the right wedge of Minkowski spacetime. That region of Minkowski spacetime described by uh, this relation between the X coordinate and the, and the time coordinate, um, suppressing the Y and Z coordinates for, for convenience. Um, so that corresponds literally to, to a wedge, right? If Minkowski spacetime is, is thought of as a two-dimensional surface, then it's this right wedge region of it that corresponds to, to this, uh, uh, this constraint on the coordinates. Uh, um, this right wedge is sometimes referred to as the Rindler, right Rindler wedge of Minkowski spacetime. Um, and we can introduce a new set of coordinates called Rindler coordinates uh, uh, that cover this right wedge of Minkowski spacetime, um, eta xi, where eta is uh, the Rindler time coordinate and xi is the, uh, uh, corresponds roughly to the radial coordinate, the spatial coordinate. Um, and uh, Rindler coordinates are related to uh, standard inertial coordinates right, uh, by uh, these uh, hyperbolic trigonometric functions. Um, now it turns out uh, in this right wedge of Minkowski spacetime, um, an eta time translation can be shown to be equivalent to a Lorentz boost in uh, 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 inertial coordinates, Tx coordinates. 
Um, and one way to show this is by uh, taking the generator of translations in the eta direction, eta time direction, which is this vector field, uh, d by d eta, um, and just applying the uh, Rindler uh, coordinate transformations, uh, the inverse of the Rindler coordinate transformations to it. And what you get is uh, the vector field on the right, which turns out to be the generator of uh, Lorenz booths. Um, and taking a step back, right, uh, a bit of terminology, um, both time translations and Lorentz booths are symmetries of the Minkowski metric, um, and a vector that generates a symmetry um, is referred to as a Killen vector. Um, so uh, uh, the Minkowski interval can be expressed in terms of Rindler coordinates, um, and in Rindler coordinates, it takes this fairly simple form. Um, and, and then again, Rindler spacetime can be simply defined as the right wedge uh, of Minkowski spacetime. <clears throat> um, uh, um, and its interval again in Rindler coordinates is given by this expression, where the Rindler coordinates uh, um, um, have these corresponding ranges. Um, so to, to, to visualize uh, this idea of, of view in Minkowski spacetime as an extension of, of Rindler spacetime, uh, we can. Uh, that's considered this diagram on the left. Um, so I've taken this diagram from the review article by, by Harlow. Um, this is a spacetime diagram of Minkowski spacetime uh, suppressing the Y and Z coordinates. Um, and it's divided into four regions, right? Um, there's the right wedge region uh, represented by this blue wedge. Uh, and there's a corresponding left wedge um, the other blue wedge, and then uh, the other two regions are the green and, and red regions. And again, Rindler spacetime is to be identified with this, the right blue wedge region. Um, and uh, within uh, uh, Rindler spacetime, the region R, um, curves of constant uh, Rindler coordinate Xi have the following three features, um, properties. Uh, um, they're hyperbola. Um, given an inertial coordinates by x squared minus t squared equals constant um, with asymptotes at uh, uh, x equals plus or minus t. These are the two dashed lines uh, that form the boundary of, of, of the R region. Um, curves of constant psi are also orthogonal uh, to eta equals constant surfaces in Rindler spacetime. So the eta equals constant surfaces are space-like surfaces, slices entirely through uh, uh, Rindler spacetime. Um, and it turns out uh, they form what are called Cauchy surfaces, right? So a Cauchy surface is a space-like surface such that uh, any causal curve that's extended indefinitely either in the future direction or the past direction ultimately intersects the, the surface at a point. Um, so uh, uh, the eight equals constant surfaces in Rindler spacetime have that property. And it turns out the collection of all eight equals constant surfaces uh, form a foliation, completely foliate uh, Rindler spacetime. Um, and the last property of curves of constant psi in Rindler spacetime are that they turn out to be the integral curves of the generator of uh, translations in the eta direction, right? This, this, this Killen vector. Um, all right. Um, now, uh, uh, one feature of Minkowski spacetime that you can then prove is that uh, uh, is the, the claim in, in this uh, uh, brown box, uh, namely, it admits what's called a bifurcate Killen horizon. Um, so, in particular, the null surface given by x equals plus or minus t. Right, that's the two dashed lines in this diagram, uh, 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 forms this thing called a bifurcate Killen horizon generated by uh, the generator of eta time translations. So the fine print here is um, a bifurcate Killen horizon is the union of two null hypersurfaces, right, uh, these two dashed lines um, that, it, that intersect in a space-like two-dimensional surface in this case, this is the origin, the point uh, at the origin of, of the x, y, x, t coordinates. Um, and that are both Killen horizons with respect to the same Killen vector, 
So a Killen horizon is a null hypersurface that's everywhere normal to a Killen vector, right? And the relevant Killen vector here again is this is this generator of translations in the eta direction. Um, so why is this particular feature of Minkowski spacetime relevant? The fact that it admits this thing called a bifurcate Killen horizon. Um, the bottom line is going to be um, a spacetime with a bifurcate Killen horizon uh, decomposes into four regions right, with respect to the Killen horizon um, and admits two distinct time-like Killen vectors, um, at least with respect to the right and left wedges. Right? So in the right wedge, um, and in the right wedge, uh, we have uh, two time-like Killen vectors, right? the generator of eta time translations and also the generator of uh, uh, time translations in, in the inertial T coordinate direction. Um, so that's a feature of Minkowski spacetime that as we'll see um, is also a feature of uh, the two wormhole spacetimes that, 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 that I'd like to review. Okay, so that's how uh, uh, to view Minkowski spacetime as an extension of a smaller spacetime. Right? Um, and to wrap up uh, this warm up exercise on Minkowski spacetime, um, let's, let's now remind, be, be reminded of uh, the notion of a conformal diagram, right? which is going to pop up again in, in uh, um, descriptions of wormhole spacetimes. Um, so, conformal diagrams right, were introduced by Roger Penrose. Sometimes they're called Penrose diagrams. Um, and his goal was to construct a diagram, a space-time diagram, in which various infinities uh, uh, that cannot be represented in a normal space-time diagram can be represented in, in this particular diagram. Right? So um, with respect to Minkowski space-time, right, intuitively there are three types of infinities. Um, if you go far enough along a time-like curve, you reach time-like infinity. If you go far enough along a space-like curve, you reach space-like infinity. And if you go far enough along a null-like curve, right, you reach null-like infinity. Um, so how can we represent these three types of infinities in a finite space-time diagram? So Penrose's intuition was, I take it, to just identify an appropriate set of, trans of coordinates that allow you to transform coordinates that perhaps have an infinite range to new coordinates that have a finite range. Right? So one example of a, of a mathematical function that accomplishes this is the inverse tan, tan function, right? It maps uh, um, its, argu uh, its arguments range, infinite range, x can range from minus infinity to infinity plus infinity uh, to a finite range of, of y values, right? Minus pi over two to plus pi over two. Um, and so with that example in mind, right? We can introduce what we might call Penrose coordinates for Minkowski spacetime, um, call them capital T prime, capital R prime, uh, related to inertial coordinates or spherical coordinates, TR, uh, by this inverse tan function. Right? Um, in particular, take the sum and the difference of these new Penrose coordinates and relate them to the sum and differences of the old coordinates by this inverse tan function. And it turns out that's enough to restrict the ranges of the new coordinates to, to finite ranges. Right? Whereas the old little t coordinate range from minus infinity to plus infinity, the new Penrose capital T prime coordinate has a finite range. And where the original little uh, radial coordinate ranged from zero to plus infinity, the new coordinate capital R prime has a finite range. Right? Um, and now we can express the Minkowski interval in these new coordinates, Penrose coordinates, and it takes this form in the second brown box, right? So it looks almost identical to the Minkowski interval in spherical coordinates, except for this prefactor term out in front, right? One over the square of cosine capital T prime plus cosine capital R prime. And it turns out it's uh, this prefactor um, encodes all the places where the original coordinates blew up, went to infinity. Right. So for various values of capital T prime and capital R prime, the prefactor diverges. Um, and it's 
and it's at those values that that correspond to uh, infinite values for the original coordinates. Um, so Penrose's idea was then uh, to uh, write down the space-time interval for a distinct space-time, a space-time that's distinct from Minkowski space-time, but that is conformally equivalent to Minkowski space-time. Right. So call the uh, space-time interval for this for this new space-time ds squared tilde tilde. Right. Um, and all we've done, all Penrose has done, is he just removed the prefactor term. So this new space-time, its metric is conformally equivalent to the Minkowski metric. It only differs by this, by this, by this factor. And that's roughly the definition of, 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 of two metrics that are conformally equivalent. Um, now, if we, uh, um, and, and then his idea was to, was to take uh, uh, these points at infinity in Minkowski space-time and represent them as points on the boundary of this new uh, uh, conformally equivalent space-time. Um, and, and the result uh, uh, in, in terms of a, an ordinary space-time diagram is hopefully this, this familiar diagram uh, called the conformal diagram or Penrose diagram from Minkowski space-time, right? In it, uh, all these various uh, uh, infinities associated with Minkowski space-time are represented in the diagram itself, right? So little i uh, superscript plus and superscript minus, um, represent uh, future and past time-like infinities in Minkowski space-time. Uh, I not represents space-like infinity, and these two surfaces, scry plus and scry minus, uh, represent future and past null infinity. Um, so that's again the uh, the conformal diagram for Minkowski space-time. Um, okay. Um, so with Minkowski spacetime um, in hand, uh, let's let's now move on to um, uh, the first example of, of a wormhole spacetime in general relativity. Um, um, this is what I'll refer to as extended Schwarzschild spacetime. Um, and to get extended Schwarzschild spacetime, let's of course first start with Schwarzschild spacetime. Um, so it is the unique uh, spherically symmetric vacuum solution to the Einstein equations with space-time interval uh, and spherical coordinates given by this expression. Um, so you might notice that this is formally similar to the Minkowski interval and spherical coordinates, except for these two prefactor terms out in front of the uh, temporal and radial uh, uh, terms. Right? And, and both of these factors involve a constant R sub S. Um, so uh, here are uh, 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 four properties of this short shield interval. And these properties are going to help us formulate an interpretation of, of, of short shield space time. Um, so the first property is the following um, for values of the radial coordinate. Um, uh, much greater than, uh, uh, if you have any questions, please, please don't hes hesitate uh, uh, to interrupt. Um, for values of the radial coordinate uh, uh, greater than uh, this constant R sub S, uh, it turns out the constant can be approximated by this value 2GM, where G is the Newtonian gravitational constant, um, and M is the mass of a spherically symmetric mass. Um, and the justification for that is it turns out uh, in this range of the radial coordinate, uh, if you derive the geodesic equation associated with this interval, um, it takes the form of Newton's second law for force due to the gravitational field of, of a spherically symmetric mass, capital M. Um, uh, a second feature, a property of the short shield interval is that uh, it diverges Right at uh, the value of the radial coordinate uh, r equals zero. Um, so uh, uh, in both the prefactor terms, right uh, in front of dt squared and dr squared, uh, um, when r is zero, uh, they, di they diverge. And this is called a physical singularity uh, because uh, if you calculate this particular scalar invariant, um, you get uh, a function uh, that's inversely proportional to uh, r to the six, right? So when r is zero, 
uh, this scalar invariant diverges. Um, and you get this, this uh, uh, observable by uh, taking the Riemann curvature tensor associated with the Schwarzschild metric and then contracting all of its indices. And that's supposed to give you a scalar quantity that's an invariant insofar it's the same, it takes the same form and uh, uh, it takes the same values in, in any coordinate system. It's independent of, of, of your coordinate system. So that's referred to as a physical singularity. Um, then uh, there's another place where the Schwarzschild interval diverges, right? And it's at the value of R uh, uh, equal to R sub S. Um, so I guess it's the second term uh, that diverges uh, when R equals R sub S. <clears throat> um, and this is called a coordinate singularity because uh, it turns out there's no corresponding divergence uh, in a curvature scalar. So this indicates that this divergence uh, perhaps is a feature of the particular coordinate system we chose to express the interval. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, at R equals R sub S, uh, we have a, 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 the, the signature of, of the metric changes. So roughly the signature of the metric is uh, uh, given by uh, the signs in front of the temporal term in the interval and the spatial terms in the interval. Right? So uh, in the convention that I've adopted, the temporal term gets a minus sign and the spatial terms get a plus sign. Um, so notice that uh, for R greater than R sub S, uh, that convention stands, right? Uh, there's a minus sign in front of the temporal term and a plus sign in front of the, uh, the radial and, and spatial terms. Uh, but for R less than R sub S, the, the signs change, right? And that suggests uh, that for R less than R sub S, the radial coordinate behaves like a temporal coordinate. Right? It now has the minus sign in front of it. And that, is in, that indicates that uh, within R, the region R less than R sub S, uh, future directed time-like and null curves eventually are gonna hit this phys the physical singularity at R equals zero. Um, if you just follow them um, along uh, as, as the R uh, uh, coordinate decreases. Um, and that in turn entails uh, that at least under one understanding of the event horizon, of an event horizon, um, the surface R equals R sub S can be identified as an event horizon. Namely, uh, it's a surface beyond which future directed timelike and null curves cannot escape to infinity. Um, so these properties then suggest uh, interpreting short field space time as the space time associated with a black hole. Um, under the understanding of a black hole, uh, 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 that uh, 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 if we understand a black hole to consist of a physical singularity, right, separated by uh, uh, an external spacetime uh, by an, an event horizon. Um, okay. Um, now, uh, uh, in in typical presentations, right, of, of short space spacetime, we're now uh, uh, we now are asked to focus on this this coordinate singularity issue, how do, we, how do we get rid of this coordinate singularity? Right? And the idea is uh, going to be that uh, we need to identify an appropriate coordinate system in which uh, uh, this coordinate singularity essentially vanishes. Right? We just need to switch to a new coordinate system. Um, and ultimately, as we'll see, um, the coordinate system that uh, we end up with is going to be associated with this extended version of Schwarzschild spacetime, what's called extended Schwarzschild spacetime. So here's sort of the standard way of getting rid of the coordinate singularity in the Schwarzschild spacetime interval. Um, so we're first asked to focus on the behavior of radial null curves, um, radial in the sense that uh, we hold the angular coordinates constant and null in the sense that we require the, uh, the space-time interval to be zero. Um, if, we, if you substitute those constraints into the Schwarzschild interval um, and solve for the ratio of dt over dr, you get this nice expression on the right. Um, um, so essentially, this is an expression for the slope right, of a radial null curve. Um, and by extension, it's, it's, it's the slope of, of, of a light cone. Um, defined by a bunch of radial null curves. 
Um, and, the, and then uh, we see that uh, for values of the radial coordinate much, much greater than R sub S, we get nice behavior for the slope of radial null curves for the behavior of light cones. The slope is just plus minus one. Um, light cones are 45 degrees given an appropriate uh, 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 adoption of units. Uh, but as we approach the event horizon, right, uh, the, the slope goes to infinity, plus or minus infinity. Um, the light cones close up. Right? <clears throat> um, so how do we deal with this initial problem? So the suggestion is uh, to pick coordinates so that the slope of a radial no line, low curve is always has this nice feature. It's always plus or minus one. Um, so we require of any coordinate system that we pick, um, the temporal coordinate should equal uh, plus or minus the radial coordinate up to an additive constant. <clears throat> um, and the initial attempt to enforce this constraint uh, uh, produces this thing called a tortoise coordinate, um, R sub star. Right, so we might initially uh, attempt to enforce this requirement by simply solving for t as a function of r in this in this equation for uh, uh, the slope of a radial null curve, and then identifying in the in the resultant expression, identifying that part uh, that uh, is independent of this of an additive uh, a constant with a new radial coordinate, this this r sub star thing. Um, and that automatically enforces this constraint. So in this new, in the new coordinate systems, system consistent of the old T coordinate and this new tortoise coordinate, R star, uh, uh, the slope of radial null curves is nice, right? Plus or minus one. Um, uh, the problem though is individually, the T coordinate and the tortoise coordinate uh, diverge as we approach the event horizon. So where the, whereas the ratio is nicely behaved independently, they, um, they are badly behaved. Um, so the next step then is, uh, well, let's try to come up with a coordinate system that addresses this problem once and for all. Um, and it turns out this set of coordinates, uh, what are called null Kruskal coordinates, UV, uh, finally solved uh, both of these issues. Right? So uh, the U and V, coordinates are defined roughly by exponentiating, right? The difference and the sum of the tortoise coordinates. Um, and they're referred to as null coordinates insofar as curves of constant U and V are, are null curves. So it turns out um, if you express the Minkowski interval in null Kruskal coordinates, uh, uh, we no longer get uh, a divergence uh, um, at the value uh, uh, that corresponds to R equals R sub S. In this case, it's UV equals zero. Um, so our problem is solved. We've gotten rid of the coordinate singularity, but at the expense of these null coordinates, right? Um, and uh, null co coordinates are useful in certain circumstances, but uh, naively, right? It's hard to determine what the temporal direction is and what the spatial directions are if you're using null coordinates. Um, so that suggests we move to yet another system of coordinates. Um, and this is the final system we're going to consider. So these are called, we can call these Kruskal coordinates, capital T, capital R. And their relation to null Kruskal coordinates is fairly simple, right? Um, the Kruskal time coordinate is just the sum of the uh, Kruskal null coordinates and the radial coordinate is the difference. Um, and so at the original coordinate singularity corresponded to you, I'm sorry, um, the null curves in Kruskal coordinates now have this, are now characterized by this nice feature, right? Um, um, they now have, they still, they, 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 they preserve this uh, invariant uh, um, feature of the slope, of their slopes, plus or minus one. Um, the original co uh, sing uh, coordinate singularity is now given uh, in Kruskal coordinates by capital T equals plus or minus capital R. Um, the physical singularity in Kruskal coordinates is given by capital T equals plus or minus square root of one plus R squared. Uh, and the exterior region 
in the cruise car coordinates now corresponds to two ranges, right? Capital R much greater than capital T and capital R much less than capital T. Um, and it turns out, again, if you express a Schwarzschild shield interval in cruise car coordinates, there's no divergence at uh, the original coordinate singularity in the old coordinates, right? That's T equals plus or minus R. Um, but one feature of cruise car coordinates, well, now we have coordinates in which, right, there's, there's a time direction and a, and a spatial direction. Um, on the other hand, it looks like, right, all the uh, constraints on cruise car coordinates correspond to the constraints on the left that define these features of Schwarzschild, our original Schwarzschild space time, um, um, are produced twice. Right? They correspond to two constraints on Kruskal coordinates. Um, so this is an indication that Kruskal coordinates cover our original space, Schwarzschild space time twice. Um, and that suggests uh, we can view Schwarzschild space time as a region, a wedge, as it turns out, in a larger space time that we might call extended Schwarzschild space time that is covered once over by uh, our Kruskal coordinates. <clears throat> so again, the analogy is uh, 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 with the Minkowski case, right? Just as we can view Minkowski spacetime as an extension of Rindler spacetime, so we can, ex we can consider um, the spacetime covered by Kruskal coordinates as, a, as an extension of, of Schwarzschild spacetime. Um, and extended Schwarzschild, the extended Schwarzschild spacetime interval uh, in Kruskal coordinates takes this explicit form. <clears throat> um, all right. So um, again, just as we can view Minkowski spacetime as an extended version of Rindler spacetime, uh, similarly, extended Schwarzschild spacetime can be thought of as an extension of Schwarzschild spacetime. So here's a diagram, a spacetime diagram of extended Schwarzschild spacetime and Kruskal coordinates. Uh, capital T, capital R. Again, I'm suppressing the uh, uh, the radial, the angular coordinates for simplicity. Um, it's similar to the spacetime diagram of Minkowski spacetime. It's divided into four regions. Um, one glaring difference, of course, is uh, the presence of this physical singularity in extended Schwarzschild spacetime. It's represented by uh, uh, the red hyperbola right, at the top and the bottom. Um, and in this case, uh, uh, the right wedge, region one, uh, can be identified with Schwarzschild spacetime. In Schwarzschild spacetime, and again, it's a an complete analogy with the Minkowski case, uh, curves of constant little r, right? That's the original radial coordinate for Schwarzschild spacetime, have these three properties. Uh, they're hyperbola, uh, capital R squared minus capital T squared equals constant in Kruskal coordinates with asymptotes at capital X equals plus or minus capital T, right? these two dashed lines. Um, they're orthogonal to little t equals constant surfaces, which again, uh, form Cauchy surfaces in short shield space time. Um, um, and uh, the family, the, the complete family uh, of such surfaces form a, a foliation of short shield space time. And thirdly, curves of constant uh, little r are uh, turn out to be integral curves of the generator uh, translations in the little t direction. Um, and in complete analogy with Minkowski case, this is a time-like Killen vector that's distinct from another time-like Killen vector in region one, uh, given by the generator of translations in the Kruskal time direction. Um, and just as in Minkowski spacetime, so in extended Schwarzschild spacetime, uh, uh, the event horizon, in this case, the event horizons, right, uh, given by the dash lines, capital R equals plus or minus T, uh, form a bifurcate Killen horizon, um, in this case, generated by uh, the generator of little t uh, translations. Um, so that's uh, 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 um, extended Schwarzschild spacetime considered as an extension of Schwarzschild spacetime with properties that are analog analogous with properties, the properties of uh, Minkowski spacetime. 
All right, but one disanalogy, of course, is the presence of uh, the physical singularity, right, in extended tortured space time. Um, and uh, well, so the next the next step now is going to be uh, 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 how we can view, we can interpret extended tortured space time um, as representing a wormhole, right? So the idea is going to be we're going to look at uh, capital T equals constant spatial slices uh, through extended torch field space time and consider the extent to which these capital T equals constant slices can be thought of as, uh, as in some sense, uh, represented a wormhole that connects regions one and four. Um, so, uh, 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 first, let's consider the particular capital T equals constant slice uh, uh, for uh, uh, capital T equals zero, right? Um, and con let's consider its geometry in terms of the original spherical coordinates. And moreover, uh, we're gonna set the theta coordinate equal to pi over two for simplicity. Um, so substitute uh, these constraints into really into the, into the Schwarzschild interval uh, for simplicity and we get this expression. Um, so this is the interval for a two-dimensional surface. Right? Um, and to visualize it, uh, 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 let's embed it in a three-dimensional uh, Euclidean space. Right? So here's the interval uh, in cylindrical coordinates for a three-dimensional Euclidean space um, to embed our two-dimensional surface into the three-dimensional Euclidean space, uh, let's equate the coefficients in front of the dr squared terms, and then we can solve for the, uh, for the z-coordinate as a function of r. Um, and we get this expression. Um, the phi uh, term drops out, right, in this case. And then we can re-express uh, the radial coordinate as a function of the z-coordinate. Um, and we get this equation down here at the bottom. And that turns out to be the equation of a parabola in the RZ plane. Right? It's represented by this blue curve in the diagram on the right. It intersects the R axis at uh, uh, R equals R sub S. Um, uh, now to uh, uh, restore, to, to, to uh, regain our two, original two dimensional surface, we have to restore uh, the phi dimension that dropped out here. And the way to do that is just to take our parabola and rotate it uh, about the z axis by two pi. Um, and the result is this two dimensional surface that uh, uh, is referred to as a paraboloid of revolution, I believe. Right. Um, so that's supposed to be a representation of the capital T equals zero spatial slice in extended Schwarzschild space time. <clears throat> um, so let's consider a number of other T equals constant slices. Right? So on the, on the left here is again, a diagram, a space time diagram of extended Schwarzschild space time. And I represented, um, so I'm, again, I'm taking this diagram from I think this is from um, uh, Sean Carroll's textbook on relativity. Um, so on the right, uh, on the left is a space-time diagram of extended Schwarzschild space-time, where uh, uh, um, uh, we've represented uh, what five t capital T equals constant spatial slices. Right, the t equals zero spatial slice that we just looked at is the c slice in this diagram. Right, and all of these slices uh, have the geometry, the spatial geometry of a, of a paraboloid of revolution. Um, so the C slice, the capital T equals zero slice, uh, has the greatest minimal cross-sectional area given by four pi r sub s. Right. Um, the B and D slices have minimal cross-sectional area four pi r, where r is less than r sub s. Um, and notice that the A and E slices are disconnected uh, because they intersect the uh, physical singularity. Right? Um, so 
this representation of the spatial slices, actually the, the capital T of Wisconsin spatial slices of extended short field space time suggests uh, an, uh, an interpretation in terms of a wormhole. Right? So we might think of uh, the wormhole at an instant as represented by any of these T equals constant spatial slices of extended short field space time. Um, and we might uh, uh, define uh, the wormhole wormhole's throat as the region of a given spatial slice between the left and right event horizons, right? So for the C slice, there really is, a, it has a trivial throat, right? There's no region interior to the event horizon um, contained in the C slice. So if you're following along the C slice from region one, you go through the event horizon, right? At this thing called the bifurcation surface, and then immediately you exit the event horizon into region four. Right. There's no, there's no region, subregion of, of the C slice that's wholly within the event horizon. Um, on the other hand, the B and D slices do have subregions contained within the interior region of the event horizon. In the D slice, uh, we have this green region that might be identified as the wormhole throat. Um, in the B slice, we have this red region. Um, and the e, A and E slices also have wormhole throats, but Again, they're disconnected. Um, okay. So, and uh, of course, right, uh, there is this historically, uh, this article from 1935 by Einstein and Rosen, um, in which they suggest that these spatial slices uh, through what we're calling extended sorts of space time can, can be thought of as a bridge that connects these two disconnected regions, region one and region four. <clears throat> Um, so that's the wormhole interpretation of uh, extended Schwarzschild space time. Um, all right, so now let's uh, uh, again remind ourselves of, of what the conformal diagram for extended Schwarzschild space time looks like. Um, so, again, an analogy with the case of Minkowski space time, um, uh, we can pull in right, the various types of infinities associated with extended short space spacetime into a finite diagram. If we just uh, uh, switch to a new set of coordinates, let's, again, let's call these Penrose coordinates. Of course, they're different from the Penrose coordinates from Minkowski spacetime. Um, let's call them capital T double prime and capital R double prime. Uh, but, uh, right, the method is the same. We're gonna relate them to the Kruskal coordinates uh, using this inverse tan function um, in this way. Um, and that effectively uh, 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 guarantees that uh, the ranges of the double prime coordinates are finite. <clears throat> um, and in these new Penrose coordinates for extended torch of space time, uh, we can right, represent these various features of short space spacetime, right? The singularity at r equals zero. If you go through the coordinate transformation to Penrose coordinates uh, uh, is represented by two straight lines. Um, recall that in the original Kruskal coordinates, it was represented by two hyperbola. Um, so the details here just involve applying some identities from trigonometry to uh, uh, to the uh, to the relations that the Penrose coordinates satisfy, um, and then you can also show that the event horizon represented in Kruskal coordinates by capital P equals plus or minus r um, uh, uh, is represented in these new Penrose coordinates by the same by the same expression, uh, capital T double prime equals plus or minus capital R double prime. Um, so this indicates that uh, the event horizon and these new coordinates remains, uh, is represented again by straight lines as it is in Kruskal coordinates. Um, and then the third feature here is uh, these Penrose coordinates preserve the invariant light cone structure uh, uh, of, the, of the Kruskal coordinates, right? All light cones are at 45 degrees, uh, with respect to an appropriately chosen uh, system of units, uh, the slope of, of radial uh, null curves is plus or minus one. 
Um, so all of these properties then can be represented in a space-time diagram, right? So here's the uh, uh, conformal or Penrose diagram for extended torch field space-time. Um, the physical singularity uh, is represented in these Penrose coordinates by these two straight lines, uh, uh, red straight lines or surfaces, if we add back the, uh, the angular coordinates, right? The event horizon is represented by these two dash lines. Um, the space-time is still separated into four regions, right? The two exterior regions are one and four. And then we have these two interior regions, interior to the event horizon, two and three. Um, all right. Um, so that's extended Schwarzschild spacetime, right? The first example of a wormhole spacetime uh, in general relativity. Um, so with that example in hand, uh, we can now move on to uh, a second example of a wormhole spacetime in general relativity. Um, and this is uh, what we might call extended ADS Schwarzschild spacetime. Um, and as you might imagine, to get extended ADS Schwarzschild spacetime, we first have to consider um, ADS Schwarzschild spacetime. Um, and to get a grasp on ADS Schwarzschild spacetime, let's first begin with ADS spacetime. Um, oh, uh, question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask. So, uh, just a quick clarification and then a more substantive question. So, the clarification is so, in the, let's say, in the Chris Kalsakri's coordinates or the, if I want to consider uh, an astrophysical black hole, then is it right that I'll just take the top right quadrant? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so this diagram, uh, sometimes this diagram is, is interpreted as uh, an eternal black hole. Right? Yeah. Um, um, and to get a black hole, to represent a black hole that perhaps is the result of gravitational collapse of a of some gravitated mass. Um, yeah, so the diagram, the, you, you'd have to include the world line of the gravitated mass in the, in right. the conformal diagram. And it effectively cuts off uh, regions three and four. Um, it, so this is the same in the previous diagram as well, the, U, the KS diagram, right? Not the Pendros diagram, but the the, oh, right, the, the, the space time diagram in Kruskal. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's the same. So it's just the top right quadrant. Is mm -hmm. the, okay, uh, thanks. And the second thing is, so the, so, so uh, you mentioned, you know, the Schwarzschild space time can, we now know is motivated. We can sort of go, tell some physical story of how something like Schwarzschild statement, uh, space time can come about by collapse of stars, but with these extended uh, space times. That's at this point we don't know any physical process that could lead to this full extended space time, right? It's just we can write these coordinates out to these regions, and we think there might be something there, but there's no physical reason we think there's something there. Is there? Um, I think that's right. Yeah. I okay. mean, um, so as we'll see, right? Uh, um, one interpretation um, uh, of the conformal diagram for uh, extended ADS Schwarzschild spacetime. Um, uh, uh, eventually, uh, Maldacene and Susskind suggest it, it, it represents uh, um, two entangled black holes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that I mean, it, that, 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 that's a physical system, right? But whether or not such a physical system exists is, is a, right. um, a different question. But in, in other words, I mean, there, in other words, there, 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 you can come up with physical interpretations mm -hmm. of, say, this thing called an eternal black hole. I see. Okay, but the I guess the the process leading right, we we have a very good understanding of how astrophysical black holes form. We don't really have a very good understanding of how those entangled black holes create, you know, combine to create these kinds of space times, right? Yeah, that, that's a fair, yeah. that's a fair, fair, fair okay. statement. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, so here is the uh, uh, space-time interval for ADS space-time in spherical coordinates. Right? It's the unique vacuum solution to the Einstein equations with negative a constant negative curvature. 
Um, and in form, right, uh, uh, it's similar to the uh, Minkowski interval in spherical coordinates, um, except for, uh, again, this, these prefactors in front of the uh, uh, dt squared and dr squared terms. Um, and, and they're different, right, from the case of Schwarzschild spacetime. So here they involve, uh, the second term involves uh, a constant little a, uh, which is the radius of curvature um, of ADS spacetime. Um, and as it goes to infinity, uh, ADS, the ADS interval uh, uh, becomes the Minkowski interval. Um, and that's ADS spacetime. Uh, to get ADS Schwarzschild spacetime, at least uh, uh, mathematically, uh, it requires just a slight modification to the ADS interval. Um, so ADS Schwarzschild spacetime is the unique spherically symmetric vacuum solution to the Einstein equations with constant negative curvature and interval and spherical coordinates given by this expression. Right? Uh, uh, we've just added uh, this middle term uh, to the two prefactors in the ADS interval. Um, so for large R, right, ADS, the ADS Schwarzschild interval uh, becomes the ADS interval, right? For large R, uh, the middle terms in these two prefactors uh, drops out. Um, on the other hand, for small r, um, the last term drops out and the ADS Schwarzschild interval becomes the Schwarzschild interval. Um, and just as the Schwarzschild interval uh, uh, in spherical coordinates uh, has a coordinate singularity, um, in that case, it was at r equals r sub s, um, the ADS Schwarzschild interval also has a coordinate singularity at a value of r, uh, but not r, r sub s, it's that value, call it r sub h, uh, that solves this expression, right? I just take the, uh, the prefactor inside the parentheses and set it to zero, solve for R. That value of R uh, 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 makes this interval blow up. Um, really, it makes the, the radial term blow up. Um, and again, an analogy with uh, the short shield case, uh, uh, we can get rid of this coordinate singularity uh, by uh, adopting an appropriate set of coordinates, right? Then the, the analog of Kruskal coordinates in the short shield case. So we can transform to Kruskal-esque uh, coordinates uh, to get rid of the coordinate singularity in a light cone invariant way, right? So the, the new coordinates uh, are chosen so, so as to preserve the, the invariant nature of the light cones. Um, and just as with Extend and and the and the and the space time we get as a result, right, uh, uh, is can be thought of as an extension of of ADS Schwarzschild space time, in the same way that the space time that's completely covered by Kruskal coordinates can be thought of as an extension of, of Schwarzschild space time. <clears throat> um, so um, and 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 similarly, uh, we can adopt um, a wormhole interpretation of extended ADS Schwarzschild space time in terms of uh, constant T slices, right? Um, where T in this case are these, are these Kruskal coordinates adapted to ADS Schwarzschild, ADS Schwarzschild context. Um, and uh, of course we can uh, construct a conformal diagram of ADS Schwarzschild spacetime, extended ADS Schwarzschild spacetime. In this case, it looks like this. Um, it turns out uh, the physical singularity is represented in the appropriate Penrose coordinates uh, uh, by a hyperbola, not by a straight line. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, extended ADS Schwarzschild spacetime has a boundary at r equals infinity, which is, I think, in this case, it's 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 time-like. Um, and uh, right it, here's the event horizon at r equals R sub H, um, you can show that it also defines a bifurcate Killen horizon. It divides the spacetime into three, re four regions, two exterior um, and two interior. 
Um, all right, so to step back, um, we've now looked at uh, three examples of space times that we can interpret as extended space times of smaller space times, roughly, right? Um, Minkowski space time as an extension of Rindler space time, and then these two additional examples, extended Schwarzschild space time, extended ADS Schwarzschild space time. Um, in the last column, right, Minkowski space time does not admit an interpretation in terms of a wormhole, whereas the other two cases do. Um, so, so far, this is just general relativity, right? Um, general relative, uh, uh, three uh, solutions to the Einstein equations, two of which admit interpretations in terms of wormholes. Um, so the next question is, what do these space times have to do with quantum entanglement? Because right? ER equals EPR uh, relates wormholes to entanglement. Um, the story to come is going to be um, for the first, for all three of these examples, um, a vacuum state of a quantum field in the extended space time can be expressed as an entangled state across the left and right wedges. So that's one way of relating uh, entanglement with, with space time structure. Um, and the second part of the story to come, is, uh, uh, we'll end the story with Maldacena's uh, example in which he reinterpreted the entangled state associated with case C uh, as an entangled state in a boundary CFT, right? So he's gonna introduce uh, an ADS CFT element into uh, uh, this account of uh, um, how a quant uh, states of a quantum field in a background space time can be can be expressed as entangled states. Um, all right, so that's the end of the first part. Um, I'd like to move on now to the second part of the lecture. Again, this is a review of uh, quantum entanglement and how it relates to space-time structure. And the context is gonna be um, quantized in a field in a background space-time. So we're first gonna review the standard procedure for quantizing a field in Minkowski space-time. Um, and then roughly by analogy, we'll see how that translates into quantizing a field in extended Schwarzschild space-time. Right? The big difference between these space-times is, right? Extended Schwarzschild space time is a wormhole space time. Um, all right. So, quantum entanglement in Minkowski space time. Um, the claim uh, that I'd like to consider is the following uh, The vacuum state of a quantum field in Minkowski space time can be expressed as an entangled state over the left and right Rindler wedges, right, the blue regions. Um, in, in the space-time diagram of, of Minkowski space-time. Um, and there are at least three uh, routes to such a to a demonstration of claim uh, of this claim. Uh, a, a question? Yeah, sorry, perhaps uh, after, because it's a clarificatory question for the previous construction. So perhaps uh, once you are done with this, so, so I may go back, so. No, but the, the thing is that um, given the, the previous question, so just a, a general remark, I mean, one should uh, keep a critical look at this wormhole construction to begin with, because uh, um, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a fact in, in the physical community that this is, this is controversial. For one thing, because, okay, the, the idea comes from basically getting rid of this uh, singularity in social space time. Okay, but it's not entirely clear to what extent. I mean, just adding this uh, additional, sorry, this additional set of uh, coordinates, cruise call in this case, actually adds any physical meaningful. The, and and the, th the thing is just to link with the previous question about black holes, I mean, the, the problem is that, for instance, in, in several approaches to, to quantum gravity, I mean, there is a clear dynamical reason why basically no singularity emerges at all. So in that sense, basically, it's not like uh, uh, just a sort of 
mathematical artifact in the sense that just defining a set of uh, coordinates that, okay, gets rid of the initial singularity and towards it, but by no means uh, means that uh, that new set of coordinates represents anything physical. Whereas in, in different approaches, this uh, singularity basically is avoided altogether by the, by the very dynamics of the theory. So in that sense, for instance, in black holes, I mean, there are some proposals, of course, I mean, this is uh, uh, beyond any observational um, uh, size so, so far, but okay, there are uh, promising proposals that uh, the singularity within a black hole can be avoided. And this is uh, what's in the literature are called blank stars. Anyway, my point is just before and moving to this uh, ER EPR um, sort of conjecture, which, okay, fair enough. I mean, one, one should keep an, an, a critical attitude regarding the very construction of a wormhole. So, uh, but okay, it was a, just a general remark, I mean, to, to have in mind because, uh, um, well, I think it's, it, it's it's a clash between different attitudes in, in, in theoretical physics regarding uh, those uh, basically coming from higher physics inspired sync theory and those basically coming from canonical approaches to quantum gravity. This is something that it's a uh, fairly general clash in attitudes to, to, to several um, problems. So, uh, okay. So that was just my, my general remark. Okay, um, but I, I, so, so the idea is uh, that uh, uh, so, so this is sort of a mathematical construction, right? It, it's um, it's physical in the sense that it's it's it is a solution to the Einstein equations, right? But but I get so so is is your is your remark concerning right? Um, yes, well, it, it, it's a mathematical mean... solution, but but what the extent to which it's a physically relevant solution might be. Yeah, because in, in GR, question. we also have uh, closed loops and that doesn't mean that we have Gödel space times, which are, okay, strictly speaking are mathematical uh, solutions to Einstein equations, but basically it, it's uh, quite clear, quite unclear to take them um, physically real. So that, that's basically the, 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 the thrust of, 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 my, of my remarks. So, Fair enough. I mean, one, one of course may may have this uh, understanding in terms of wormholes. I'm not saying it, it is, of course, uh, um, anything uh, to be discarded because uh, we are basically far from any reliable uh, observations on, on either side on basically singularity or or, or avoiding um, altogether. But okay, just. Uh, to have uh, uh, basically uh, a, a piece of the, of the big picture and what this uh, warm hope comes about. So, but okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, fair enough, yeah. So, so again, one attitude might be, you know, th these are highly idealized uh, solutions to the Einstein equations. Um, um, how seriously should we take them from a physical point of view and by implication, uh, how seriously should we take uh, any hypothesis based on them, right? In particular, the ER equals CPR hypothesis. Yeah, I, I, if, I, I think that's a fair question. Um, um, but so I, I'm gonna push that question to the side <laughs> and continue the, um, uh, at least, uh, you know, so, so my goal here is to try to understand uh, the motivations uh, uh, for uh, uh, the uh, the proposal in, in this in, in Maldacene and Susskind's original article. Um, and yes, one criticism is, uh, um, or one concern is 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 how physically relevant uh, should we uh, uh, should we take uh, should we uh, how physically relevant is the proposal itself? Um, okay. Um, but so, so re to return to uh, uh, the exposition, um, so we'd like to demonstrate this claim about uh, the vacuum state of a quantum field in Minkowski spacetime. 
right? Because there is a sense in which uh, this is a way of at least initially understanding how uh, entanglement might be related to space-time structure, right? And ultimately, as we'll see uh, in, in, in Maldacena's example, um, it, it, it's intimately connected to, uh, in particular, the quantization of a field in, in his case, in ADS, extended ADS short space spacetime. Um, so there are at least three ways of attempting to demonstrate this claim, this specific claim. Um, uh, and the first, I, I think, may be more familiar to philosophers of physics uh, than the second. Uh, so the first uh, is uh, uh, we use the sort of standard canonical quantization procedure to quantize our field in Minkowski spacetime. Um, and as I understand it, it, it consists of three steps. So we take our field, um, we take solutions to the relevant field equations and we uh, decompose them into negative and positive frequency modes. So we perform this mode analysis. Um, and then in step two, we equip the space of positive frequency solutions with an inner product and then complete it to form a single particle Hilbert space. Um, and then in step three, uh, we get a Fox space. Uh, uh, we define a multi-particle Fox space in terms of, of these single particle Hilbert spaces. Um, so that's sort of the canonical way of, in a nutshell, that's, that, that's the canonical way of quantizing a field. Um, and if we're doing it with respect to Minkowski spacetime, uh, it turns out the first step can be done in the right Rindler wedge uh, in one of two ways, right? To uh, decompose the field into negative and positive frequency modes, we re uh, requires implicitly requires a, a, a temporal direction, right? and we have two different temporal directions, roughly speaking, in the right wedge. Right? We have the temporal direction associated with the eta Rindler eta coordinate. Um, so here's the uh, uh, generator of eta time translations, but we also have uh, the time direction associated with the inertial little t uh, coordinate. Um, and it turns out if you go through these steps using the eta coordinate initially to, to split your frequencies, so to speak, uh, then you, the, uh, 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 you obtain what's called a representation of the canonical commutation relations associated with your field that in the literature is called the fulling representation. Um, and it has a unique vacuum state. Uh, the convention is, uh, 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 this vacuum state is called the Rindler vacuum. On the other hand, if you go through this procedure using the uh, little t coordinate initially, um, the representation of the canonical commutation relations you get as a result is called the Minkowski representation with corresponding unique vacuum state uh, called the Minkowski vacuum. <clears throat> Um, and then uh, uh, you can then sh show, and it takes a fair amount of, of lines to, to show this, um, but standard presentations of quantizing a field in Minkowski spacetime uh, ultimately lead to this expression. Um, the claim here is, uh, so let H, L, and H, R be one particle Hilbert spaces with respect to the left and right Rindler wedges, degrees of freedom supported in the left and right Rindler wedges. Um, now restrict the Minkowski vacuum to the right Rindler wedge. Um, and then it turns out the claim is you can then express uh, the restriction of the Minkowski vacuum to the right Rindler wedge um, in terms of an entangled state over the left and right wedges, right? where uh, n sub L and n sub R are eigenstates of energy in the left and right wedges. Um, and in this expansion coefficient term, uh, beta takes this particular form, two pi divided by kappa, where kappa is the surface gravity of the, of the Killen horizon. So here, here's an expression that explicitly right, describes the vacuum state of a quantum field in Minkowski spacetime as an entangled state across the left and right wedges. Um, but in the philosophy of physics literature, um, 
uh, it is, it's been pointed out that this expression as it stands is mathematically ill-defined um, from kind of a rigorous point of view. Um, these two representations of the canonical commutation relations, the Fullen and the Minkowski representations are unitarily inequivalent. Um, there's no isomorphism between them, um, roughly speaking. And this has been pointed out in, the, in a number of articles. Um, um, so that's a, uh, if, if you're, if you'd like, you know, if, if you'd like a rigorous demonstration of uh, the claim that the Minkowski vacuum state is entangled across the left and right wedges, then this route uh, uh, gives you less than you might want. Um, now there's an alternative route. Um, and this is the route that uh, seems to be adopted in, in a lot of the physics literature on this subject. Um, so in this, in his Jerusalem lectures on black holes, uh, uh, Harlow describes this route. It's also summarized in an article by Ted Jacobson um, and in uh, um, Hartman's lectures. <clears throat> so this is the Euclidean path integral route towards demonstrated um, entanglement of the vacuum state of a, of a quantum field um, in Minkowski spacetime. So as I understand it, uh, it involves these three steps. So the first step, uh, we express the overlap between the Minkowski vacuum and some field configuration state as a Euclidean path integral uh, that depends on Euclidianized time, right? where T sub E is just I times little t. And then in the second step, we change variables in our path integral. Uh, we switch from Euclidean T sub E time to Euclidianized eta time. And remember, eta is the Rindler time coordinate, um, and eta sub e is just i times eta. Um, and we change our field configuration variable uh, to those appropriate, those with uh, uh, that associated with left and right wedges. So, in the physics literature, literature this this is sometimes uh, described as a trivial "quote unquote" change of variables. It's the same integral; we're just switching our variables. And then the third step, we re-express the so transformed integral uh, as a transition amplitude. Um, and then we massage that transition amplitude into the form in which uh, on one side is an expression for the Minkowski vacuum and on the other side is, is an entangled state over the left and right wedges. Um, so here's my understanding of, of how these three steps uh, 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 pan out. Um, so in the first step, right, the idea is we begin with the overlap between the Minkowski vacuum and this field configuration state, and ultimately one express it as a Euclidean path integral, but there's this intermediary step where we represent the Minkowski vacuum as the limit as Euclidean time goes to infinity of a, a Euclidean time evolved arbitrary field configuration state. Um, and there are at least two arguments that attempt to justify this way of representing not just the Minkowski vacuum state, but any vacuum state. Right? So in the first argument, the idea is that uh, Euclidean time evolution damps out excited states. Right? So in normal time evolution, the time evolution operator is e to the minus i times T times H, H is the ha appropriate Hamiltonian, right? the generator of time translations. Um, and if we take T to infinity and E to the minus I T H, we get this oscillating behavior. Um, but if we absorb the I into this definition of Euclidean time, uh, there's no longer an I in the exponent. Um, we have this nice dampened behavior, right? So E to the minus T E H, as T e goes to infinity, uh, the exponent goes to zero. So regardless of what chi is, um, if we Euclidean time evolve it long enough, um, all its excitations damp out and we get the vacuum state. Um, so that's one argument. Um, another argument uh, I've seen is, is the following. At, at finite temperatures, 
Euclidean time can be interpreted as one over the temperature. Um, and if that, if you adopt that uh, uh, attitude, then a, a large Euclidean time states correspond to low temperature states. Right? And in the limit, um, as T e goes to infinity, we get the lowest temperature state, i.e. the vacuum. Um, so that's the inter intermediary state, right? We now have uh, this transition amplitude that we can now express as a path integral, right? And the path integral is over field configurations between some initial configuration, chi at Euclidean time minus infinity to some final configuration phi at Euclidean time equal to zero. <clears throat> Right. Um, it's an infinite range, um, and we're starting at minus infinity because, in a sense, we're, we're preparing the Minkowski vacuum by time evolving this arbitrary state um, um, in Euclidean time. Um, so it's a path integral between initial and final field configuration states uh, in the lower half of Euclidean space time, uh, minus infinity less than T sub e less than zero. Um, so that's that's the first step, um, and then in the second step, right, involves this so-called trivial change of variables. So here's a space-time diagram of uh, Euclidean space-time. Um, our path integral is over the lower half of Euclidean space-time, right, from T e equals minus infinity up to the surface T e equals zero. Um, we then observe that the lower half of Euclidean spacetime uh, uh, is covered by this foliation of eta e equals constant surfaces. So we can integrate over the lower half of Euclidean spacetime by beginning with some eta e equals constant surface in the left wedge. That would be eta e equals pi. Um, and integrate in all over all a to e equals constant surfaces to finally get to the a to e equals two pi constant surface uh, in the right wedge. And we still are integrating over the entire lower half of Euclidean space time. But now we, we're, we're disintegrating over different, different variables, time variables. Right? Um, and uh, if we're going to switch to a to e variable, we also have to change our our field configuration variables. So now the initial configuration variable should be some configuration supported in the left wedge, call it phi L, and the final variable should be some configuration supported in the right wedge, call it phi R. And then we, I guess we have to add this CPT anti-linearity map between HL and HR to make sure that uh, um, um, uh, uh, the, the, the configuration variables are associated with, with the same Hilbert space. Um, so assumedly a, a trivial change of variables. Um, and then step three, we're now gonna re-express the path integral on the right back as a transition amplitude, right? So um, it corresponds to the transition amplitude be between some initial state phi L and some final state phi R, um, and we're time evolving phi L using this operator between uh, uh, eta equals pi and eta equals two pi. So we get the factor of pi there. And the Hamiltonian we're using here uh, is what's called the boost Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian associated with the eta uh, coordinate, uh, eta E coordinate. So here's, the claim is here's the transition amplitude associated with the uh, uh, path integral after the change of variables. Um, now you can insert a complete set of states and uh, take advantage of the antilinearity property of the, of the capital theta operator. And eventually we get this line, the second to last line at the bottom of the slide, which relates the original quantity we started with, right? The overlap between the Minkowski vacuum and the phi state um, with um, this weighted sum of overlaps between our, our, our 
left and right uh, field configuration states and uh, um, in this case, energy eigenstates of the, uh, of the boost Hamiltonian. And the very last step involves right, roughly uh, we're lopping off uh, the bras on either side, right? the field configuration states. And again, we're left with this expression uh, for the Minkowski vacuum in terms of an entangled state over the left and right wedges. <clears throat> um, but again, right, if, if, if you're rigorously minded, you might, I think you might find this very last step a bit problematic because it suggests uh, that we're equating um, two states uh, that belong to unitarily and equivalent representations of the canonical commutation relations, right? Um, and that, from a rigorous point of view, is, is, is problematic. <clears throat> um, so stepping back, right? Uh, I think uh, uh, the authors who advocate this approach uh, 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 observe that one advantage of it is uh, we did not have to assume the field that we're quantizing uh, was a free field. And it turns out that's an assumption you have to make in, in the canonical comp, uh, quantization approach, route one. Um, on the other hand, it does seem to look like this path integral approach still faces uh, this, this problem from, from, from the rigorous point of view, um, this problem of unitarily inequivalent representations. Um, so how to address this? Uh, well. So, so what do we have? What, what, what can we say about this claim about the vacuum state of a quantum field, the Minkowski spacetime being entangled across the left and right wedges? Um, here are some options, and I'm going to call uh, these options just the third route, right? So, if you're concerned about this issue of unitary equivalence, then one way to address it is to insert a cutoff into your field theory, right, and thereby turning it. Uh, transforming it from a, field, a theory with an infinite number of degrees of freedom to one with a finite number. And it turns out uh, uh, in a quantum field theory with a finite number of degrees of freedom, all representations of the canonical commutation relations are unitarily equivalent. So there's no problem of unitary equivalence uh, in theories with a cutoff. Um, alternatively, there are these really abstract, rigorous results you can prove, for instance, in algebraic quantum field theory um, involving the riesz leader theorem that lets you claim, uh, uh, make a general claim about vacuum entanglement of a quantum field across arbitrary space-like separated regions. Um, so in any event, right, this claim, specific claim about the vacuum state of a field in Minkowski, Minkowski space time being entangled across the left and right wedges um, probably can be made more rigorous if, if you so desire. Um, all right, um, that's quantum entanglement in Minkowski spacetime, quantum entanglement in extended Schwarzschild spacetime. Um, the claim is similar, right? The claim now is the vacuum state of a quantum field in extended Schwarzschild spacetime can be expressed as an entangled state over regions one and four, right? the two wedge regions. Um, and there's a quick and dirty argument that supports this claim, uh, which is based on the observation that near the event horizon, uh, short shield space time, at least the short shield interval is formally identical to the Rindler interval. Um, so near uh, the event horizon, you might claim uh, we can, since we can express the Minkowski vacuum as an entangled state. Uh, similarly, we can express the correlate of the Minkowski vacuum uh, in extended Schwarzschild spacetime as an entangled state over the, over the correlates of the left and right Rindler wedges. Um, so the correlate of the Minkowski vacuum state in extended Schwarzschild spacetime is this thing called the hartle hawken vacuum state. Um, it's this vacuum state associated with uh, uh, the Fox space built on the Kruskal time, big T coordinate, right? um, as opposed to the, uh, the correlate of the Rindler coordinates, the, the original R and T coordinates, little r and little t coordinates. Um, 
the slight difference is uh, the expression here for the uh, 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 Hardo Hawken vacuum uh, in the expression, uh, the constant beta uh, takes a different takes a different value. Um, all right. Um, if you're not satisfied with, with that quick and dirty argument, right? Again, uh, uh, you 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 get pre you're presented with a slightly more detailed argument involved in involved in these Euclidean path integral techniques. Um, and in this case, uh, uh, the procedure is a little different than it was for the Minkowski case, uh, insofar as, in this case, the procedure is based on an argument uh, that claims uh, Euclidean short shield time uh, is periodic, is cyclic. Um, so I'm gonna attempt to describe at least my understanding of what this means here. And perhaps in Johanna's uh, uh, lectures tomorrow, she, 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 she might make this a bit more clear. Um, so that's the first step. And then the second step, the second and third steps follow uh, uh, the, the steps uh, in the Minkowski case. <clears throat> um, so here's the first step. Um, how can we convince ourselves that uh, uh, in Euclidean short shield space time, the time coordinate is periodic? Um, so let's first express uh, uh, the short shield interval in, in, in Euclidean uh, uh, time. Let's call this the Euclidean short shield interval, right? Um, here I'm suppressing the angular coordinates. Um, and the only difference between this and the short shield interval is that we've absorbed the minus sign right in front of the temporal uh, term into the definition of T sub E. Um, now we can introduce a new radial coordinate, call it rho, um, as a function of the original radial coordinate little r. And it turns out uh, the uh, short shield radius, this constant r sub s in this way. And then you can show <clears throat> Uh, then, and then you can re-express the Euclidean short shield interval in, uh, in terms of this new radial coordinate rho, um, and then look, and, and this is what it looks like initially, and then look, uh, and then uh, uh, consider it in, in, in for the case in which the radial coordinate is, approx uh, is, is roughly uh, equal to uh, r sub s. Um, that just makes this prefactor out uh, in front of the uh, row term identically one, right? And then we get the interval for Euclidean short shield space time expressed in TE and row coordinates in this form at the bottom. And that looks formally equivalent to the interval for a flat Euclidean space and polar coordinates, right? Where the angular coordinate theta uh, is played by the ratio of TE over 2RS. Um, and it turns out, right, uh, the rate of the coordinate singularity at R equals R sub S uh, occurs at rho equals zero. But if we treat rho, uh, if we treat uh, uh, TE, as an angular polar coordinate, um, that allows us to treat the point rho equals zero as the origin of our uh, 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 polar coordinates. Um, so in these coordinates, we can treat the sing coordinate singularity at rho equals zero as the origin of a, of, of a two-dimensional Euclidean plane, provided we identify T sub e uh, as an angular polar coordinate with a corresponding uh, two pi uh, uh, per period, or more precisely, TE over two times R sub S. Right? So that indicates uh, uh, Euclidean time is periodic in four pi R sub S. Um, so here's uh, a space time diagram of Euclidean short shield space time in. Uh, 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 well, I guess in the original uh, uh, R and uh, Euclidean time TE coordinates, right? So uh, Euclidean time is under the assumption that Euclidean time is periodic, right? 
Um, so the origin is at R equals R sub S, the original coordinate singularity, um, and the lower half of, Euclid of, of Euclidean torch field spacetime is given by this uh, uh, shaded region, right? Um, um, this is the region for T equals zero to T equals two pi R S. So Euclidean torch field spacetime can be represented by this, by this cigar diagram. Um, so that's the first step. Um, and then in the second step, right? And we, we go through this process of representing um, our vacuum state, in this case, the hartle hawkins state, uh, the overlap between the hartle hawkins state and some field configuration state phi as a path integral by means of this intermediate step. Right? Um, in this case, the path integral is still over the lower half of Euclidean of the, of the corresponding Euclidean spacetime, in this case, Euclidean Schwarzschild spacetime, uh, but now it's, right, it's periodic right, in, in, in TE. So the integral is from at some initial configuration state at T equals zero to some final configuration state at T e equals two pi R S. Um, and then in the last step, I re, re express this integral as transition amplitude. Um, and then go through this process of massaging it into this second penultimate form, and then lop off the field configuration states on either side to get this final expression, right? That formally is identical to the expressions we got in the uh, Minkowski case. Um, one difference is again, the, the value of this, of the beta term. Um, and, and again, if, from a rigorous point of view, there is this issue about, in this procedure, about moving from this second to last step to this last step. <clears throat> um, all right, so that's how to quantize a field in uh, short shield space time, uh, extended short shield space time. Um, and now, right, the analogy now is or the next step is uh, to extend this procedure to quantize in a field in extended ADS Schwarzschild spacetime. Um, and that turns out to be the subject of Maldacena's example, extend, uh, uh, his proposal that extended ADS Schwarzschild spacetime uh, is dual to a particular entangled state in a CFT, namely this thermal field double state. Um, so that's the last part of the lecture. <clears throat> um, so on first gla glance, right, this last example just seems to be a continuation of these other examples we just went through. We, 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 we want to quantize a field uh, in extended ADS Schwarzschild spacetime um, and express its vacuum state as an entangled state. Uh, but the new element is this appeal to the ADS CFT correspondence. And it seems that there two ways to view this new element. Um, you might view it as an appeal to the ADS-CFT correspondence to justify um, expressions of this, of this sort, right? Expressions of the vacuum state in terms of an entangled state. Um, alternatively, um, you might view uh, his ex Maldacena's example as an appeal to previously uh, uh, established uh, expressions of vacuum states in terms of entangled states um, to justify uh, this additional entry in the ADS-CFT dictionary. Um, in any event, right, the old claim seems to be this, the vacuum state of a quantum field in extended ads Schwarzschild space time can be expressed as an entangled state over the two regions, uh, one and four. Um, under this new proposal, uh, uh, his new proposal is the following under the ADS CFT dictionary, extended ADS Schwarzschild spacetime is dual to a CFT thermal field double state. Um, so, what exactly is this thermal field double state? Um, so, here's a bit of context uh, for a given quantum field theory with some Hamiltonian H uh, with uh, eigenstates little n. Um, elements of some Hilbert space H, um, we can define what's called a thermal mixed state, right? Rho 
a density operator state given by e to the minus beta uh, 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 times the Hamiltonian, um, which can be expressed in, in this form, right? Um, a weighted sum of projection operators onto each of the energy eigenstates, uh, where beta is identified as one over the temperature. Um, now, to get a thermal field double state, the idea is to purify uh, a, a given thermal mixed state. Um, and this means we want to find a pure state of a larger system such that our thermal state is uh, the reduced density operator for a given for, for, for a bipartition of the larger system into two subsystems. Um, so the thermal field double state is the purification of a thermal state obtained by the following two steps. You first double the degrees of freedom of your initial Hilbert space H to form some product Hilbert space H1 cross H2, where H1 and H2 are copies of H. And then we want to construct a pure state, just call it TFD for thermal field double. That's an element of this larger product Hilbert space, such that the original thermal state uh, can be obtained by tracing out the degrees of freedom of one of these subsystems. Um, from the uh, projection operator correspond, uh, the, the density operator corresponding to the thermal field uh, double state. Um, and the result uh, uh, right, takes this form, if this is the uh, form of the thermal state, mixed state. So we get uh, an expression for the thermal field double state uh, in terms of an entangled state right, over these two uh, uh, Hilbert factor spaces. Um, where the beta here is interpreted as one over temperature. Um, now, the way the a thermal field double state is typically presented is uh, that uh, uh, it, it's a state of a composite system, one of whose subsystems is, are, uh, is some physical system uh, that's in thermal equilibri equilibrium with a heat path uh, that, uh, that that corresponds to the second subsystem. Uh, but formally, right, it looks like uh, uh, these expressions we've been more or less deriving, right, of uh, the vacuum state of a quantum field in a background space time that emits a bifurcate Killen horizon. <clears throat> um, so that's a thermal field double state. And then the final question is what does this have to do with ADS CFT? Um, so here's the way I understand Maldacena's proposal. Um, three steps again. First, we take uh, these two Hilbert spaces, H1, H2, right, associated with the thermal field double state uh, as two copies of a conformal field theory. Um, we then go through this routine that we've gone through a couple of times already of expressing uh, the overlap between, in this case, the thermal field double state and some field configuration phi as a Euclidean path integral um, over some appropriate spatial temporal region. Right? In the previous examples, instead of the thermal field double state, it was the Minkowski vacuum or the hartle hawken vacuum. And the appropriate spatial temporal region was right, the, either the lower half of Euclidean space time or the lower half of Euclidean Schwarzschild space time. So do the same procedure for some perhaps arbitrary spatial temporal region. Um, and then in the last step, use the ads CFT dictionary to identify a corresponding bulk space time, right? So the idea is uh, uh, the space, space time region we're integrating over is roughly that region that kind of generates this TFT state. Um, an ADS CFT, uh, and this TFT state is, is associated with, with uh, uh, two copies of a conformal field theory. Um, in ADS CFT, the conformal field theory lives on the boundary of some bulk space time, right? So if the boundary is given by uh, uh, the region that this path integral is, 
is, is defined on, uh, then the bulk spacetime should just be the bulk, a bulk spacetime with this region as its boundary. Um, so to put that, to, to represent that argument and using a bit of uh, a few formula, right? Here's the standard procedure. We're representing the overlap between the thermal field double state and some field state um, in terms of a Euclidean path integral. Um, given the form of the thermal field double state, uh, uh, the range of Euclidean time that the integral is uh, uh, for the integral is T e equals zero to T e equals beta over two. Um, and that depends on, on the particular form of, of the TFD state in, on the previous slide. And now we step back and look at this path integral. It's an integral over field configurations between uh, 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 starting at chi into net phi um, on some spacetime region uh, whose temporal part is given by this interval, zero to phi beta over two. Um, and according to the ADS-CFT differentiate dictionary, right, roughly we're, uh, we're asked to uh, identify the uh, space-time that the CFT is defined on as the boundary of the space-time that the ADS theory of gravity is defined on. Right? So if script S is given by the region that this path integral is, is defined on, uh, then it's supposed to be the boundary of some, some space-time. And it turns out that space-time is, uh, it's the lower half of Euclidean extended ADS Schwarzschild space-time. Um, so I take it that's the connection that links uh, uh, ADS CFT with uh, the procedures that we've been discussing so far. Um, so Maldacena, this motivated Maldacena to suggest this particular entry, we might think of it as uh, uh, in the ADS-CFT dictionary, right? On the left, we have extended ADS Schwarzschild space-time, um, really ADS, extended Euclidean ADS Schwarzschild space-time. And on the right, uh, we have this thermal field double state. Um, now, in, in Maldacena and Susskind's uh, EPR, ER equals EPR article, uh, uh, they initially discuss this example, and they suggest uh, there are two ways of understanding uh, uh, the duality here, or essentially two ways of understanding, in particular, the, uh, uh, the bulk spacetime, um, and how it corresponds to the, uh, to the entangled state. Um, the first interpretation they consider is uh, uh, under this correspondence, we have on the left, a single black hole in thermal equilibrium. Um, and on the right, we have this, this original TFD uh, thermal field double state. <clears throat> um, and it turns out this corresponds, well, uh, there was this Hamiltonian, right? That appeared in the second step, right? In this, uh, argument that links the thermal field double state with ADS-CFT. Um, this is the thermal field double Hamiltonian. Right? That's the Hamiltonian that's defined on uh, this big factor space. Um, and there are different ways of, of writing it, right? So in one way, uh, 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 one option is to identify the thermal field double Hamiltonian as just the difference uh, between Hamiltonians of the two copies. And Maldacene and Sussan claim that understanding of the thermal field double Hamiltonian corresponds to this interpretation of the bulk space time. Um, a second interpretation they consider is that the bulk space time corresponds, can be interpreted as two entangled black holes and disconnected space-times uh, uh, regions, namely regions one and four um, with a common time. Um, and in this case, uh, the claim is uh, the appropriate thermal field double state that's dual 
to this interpretation of the left-hand side uh, is uh, the time dependent version of TFD, right? Uh, uh, in which we insert a, um, a time evolution operator. Um, given by this particular expression for the uh, thermal field double Hamiltonian. <clears throat> um, right, so that's one version of the second interpretation. The other version is um, instead of thinking of the two exterior regions as disconnected, we might think of them as connected right, eventually in the exterior space time. And so in this case, we have two black holes uh, two event horizons right, connected by a wormhole um, in which the exterior region is forms a, a, a single connected space time. <clears throat> um, okay, so so this second interpretation uh, they refer to as as a two sided black hole, um, and here's Harlow describing this second interpretation. Um, this is a quote, rather surprising consequence. Uh, two completely non-interacting systems, these two copies of the CFT uh, can nonetheless have an inter alter alternate description where there is a single connected geometry where observers from the right and left can potentially jump in, jump through the, their own event horizons and meet each other in the middle. <clears throat> um, all right. So, so that's a summary of, of Maldacena's uh, um, example. Right, of interpreted in, in, in the second way as, as two entangled black holes uh, connected by a wormhole. Um, and that's the initial motivation right, in, in Maldacin and Susskind uh, for this hypothesis that in general, um, two subsystems of a, of a composite system in an entangled state are connected by a, by a wormhole. Of course, it's a big conceptual leap to go from this particular example of two physical systems in an entangled state connected by a wormhole to this more general claim that any, any two physical systems, et cetera, right, connected, that are entangled or connected by a wormhole. Um, so in, in the next lecture, I'll, I'll look at some additional motivations for the more general claim beyond this, this first uh, uh, concrete example. Um, okay, I, I think that's all I wanted to say at this point. Does anyone have any questions? What is an equivalence, a unitary equivalence of uh, the first description? Can you say something more? During the presentation, in uh, different points, uh, there was written that uh, the uh, description are equivalent from an entirety point of view. So this could be a problem. Uh, if you can say something more about this topic. Oh, oh okay. Um, yeah, so, so the only thing, the reason I brought that up is, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so it first appeared, um, and this first attempt to demonstrate this claim about a vacuum state of a quantum field being entangled in Minkowski space time across the left and right uh, wedges, right? Um, and the only point here is that in, in, in this way of trying to demonstrate that claim, um, uh, there's this potential problem of uh, conflating two different representations of the canonical commutation relations really two different ways of quantizing the field. And it turns out these two different ways from kind of a technical point of view, at least as I understand it, um, cannot be equated with each other. Right? And it looks like that's what's going on in writing out an expression like this. We're equating um, the vacuum state of a quantum field obtained from one particular quantization method uh, that produces this thing called the Minkowski representation with objects on the right um, associated with, uh, uh, that are produced by another method of quantization, right? Associated with this thing called the Fullen representation. 
Um, and from a technical mathematical point of view, uh, you can't equate. So, so think of, I think the idea is uh, the Minkowski vacuum is an element of a Hilbert space. Uh, the NL in R uh, energy eigenstates are elements of another Hilbert space that's different from the Hilbert space of the Minkowski vacuum. Um, and you can't equate uh, uh, these elements of different Hilbert spaces in this way. I think that's that's one. I think that's one consequence of, of this of this claim of unitary inequivalence. Um, but again, right? It's it's only a problem uh, for perhaps for philosophers who are and physicists who may be motivated by more rigorous approaches to quantum field theory. Like for for those philosophers and physicists who are enamored of the algebraic formulation of quantum field theory. Um, they like to point out problems with the standard ways of, of, of presenting quantum field theory like, like these. Um, and the point is, I guess there are two points I, I wanted to make by bringing up this issue. Uh, the first point is even this alternative uh, way of demonstrating entanglement of the vacuum state of a quantum field in terms of path integrals that seems to be uh, the route of choice of physicists also seems to face the same conceptual problem right at the end of the day. So that's one point. Uh, but the other point was just that um, there are ways of dealing with this problem, right? Um, even if, you, if, you, if you're inclined by these more rigorous formulations of quantum field theory, um, there, are very, there are general results in these sorts of formulations that allow you to claim unproblematically rigorously that the vacuum state of a quantum field is entangled. Um, actually, there are a lot stronger claims. It's entangled over any arbitrary uh, regions that are space-like separated, not just these, uh, these two regions of Minkowski space-time. Um, and, 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 and the other, the other point is, um, even if you don't want to go up uh, that full-blown algebraic route, right, um, you can always insert a cutoff into your field theory and that's another way of mathematically addressing this problem of, of unitary and equivalent representations.